Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Andres. Uh, my congratulations to Team Michigan and a warm welcome to uh, those of you from around the world, particularly from our colleagues in, in Africa. Um, uh, I'm so uh, uh, excited to be in this conversation um, with my friend and colleague, uh, Minister Tedesi. And if I was being proper, as we should always be with our colleagues, particularly in Africa, I would always be referring her to her as Minister Tedesi. But Leah, I hope I can call you by our friendship name, Leah, as I know yep. you will call me Joe, because that's how we first became uh, friends uh, uh, years ago uh, back in Ethiopia. Um, Leah, I wonder if we could start. Um, I know there are a number of students who are, are listening in. You know, sometimes people hear our pedigrees um, that Andres um, just talked about, um, some of our, our mileposts. But often learners want to understand what were we thinking uh, when some of the decisions came up. So um, could you go back to your student days a little bit? Um, what were you thinking? Um, what were some of the drivers and decision points um, you know, did you decide in high school you wanted to be the Minister of Health? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so um, inspired by your position right now. You're, you're overseeing the health of a country with over 115 million people with such a deep and, and storied culture. Um, what decisions and what unfolded on your path that brought you to your, your position that kind of was recognized by some of those mileposts that Andres uh, had referenced? Could you speak a little bit about that, please? Thank you so much, uh, Joe. So I will call you Joe. <laughs> please. And it's really a truly a pleasure to be in this uh, UM Africa Week uh, panel and this fireside chat, especially with you. Uh, Joe, with uh, all the long-standing relationship we have uh, with the two institutions. And coming back to the question, uh, uh, it is definitely interesting to look back at all the decision points. And uh, going back, I actually, as a, as a child, I've always wanted to be a physician and never thought of being a minister. <laughs> but uh, since I was, a, 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 I think, a little child, I was always... Um, firm on my uh, wanting to be a doctor, a physician. And fortunately, I went to medical school, and uh, but I didn't have much of uh, the idea of where my track would go, even in terms of specialty. It was uh, when I was a clinical uh, year, first, uh, the first clinical year or the fourth year of my uh, medical school, when I started my rotations in the uh, clinical attachments, uh, my OBGYN rotation really had a big impact on me. I was trained in Jumma University, which is southwest, uh, around 300 kilometers away from Addis. It serves, it serves a large population, catchment population, uh, with, of course, uh, access problems. So I was seeing many uh, women coming with complications of labor or abortion or uh, different maternal and gynecologic problems. And really, uh, the intervention we did when it was saving lives, it was very gratifying. And of course, uh, losing lives was also uh, another side of it, which was very uh, tough. But I, I was um, really um, uh, emotionally attached to that uh, attachment. So uh, after that, I made the decision while I was in clinical uh, my, my, my first clinical rotation to continue on women's health matter. Uh, health and uh, uh, similar. So after I graduated, of course, we as in Ethiopia, we initially practice as general practitioners before we join a residency program. Uh, so uh, after practicing one year of, of uh, general practice, I joined residency in OBGYN um, in uh, Addis Ababa University. And that was really uh, the, the four years of residency were also a year that it was a, a lot of learning, but also truly gratifying in terms of service as well but it also i was i, I was kept on being drawn into the, the the system problems within the facilities i was working at when although i was in one university we did rotations in different hospitals and 
the challenges of uh, uh, the patient care were, were also uh, uh, drawing me to do to be engaged in some of the improvement work. And after I finished my residency, of course, I went back to practice. Uh, I was uh, working at, at that time at the Federal Police Force Hospital. Uh, but uh, after maybe around a year after that, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, connect with uh, the Minister of Health at the time, Dr. Tedros, whom you know very well, uh, who's the current uh, Director General of WHO, uh, because of some uh, uh, presentation I did on uh, our society. So that led to me to be uh, uh, offered to lead the St. Paul Hospital, who was at that time just in establishing a new medical school. It didn't, it was just a, a hospital for many years and then it was establishing a medical school. So it was a huge responsibility. I was uh, just out of uh, a year out of OBGYN residency with not so much leadership experience, but I had the passion. So I took the challenge and took the role of CEO of St. Paul, which was on the process of becoming a medical school. So I joined that process, which was a tough journey, but really a truly gratifying one as well in that process, which uh, so in a few years, it became St. Paul Hospital Millennium Medical College, which is a full-fledged medical school. And that was another opportunity to also connect with a lot of uh, partners. And it was in, I joined that in 2007 and the school launched in 2008. And two years later, we were still doing medical school, but we had aspirations to also start residency programs. And that was when I, I uh, had the opportunity to meet Professor Sanait Saha, who, whom you also well know, and uh, she was a faculty at the University of Michigan at the time and uh, uh, in the division of uh, REI. And she has been coming to Ethiopia to uh, work with different uh, institutions, mainly at the, uh, she was uh, working with Addis Ababa University, but after that connection, we uh, because we also had the, the really the desire to also establish uh, residency programs, and as, as a nation, we also had a problem of uh, OBGYN. I mean, uh, maternal health was a big challenge, so that led to uh, jointly establishing uh, uh, the residency program. So, through that connection, the partnership with the University of Michigan, which grew, then that also led to my uh, role in at the University of Michigan. Uh, so, but that I, I was. Uh, I still, I, as a clinician, I always thought I would <laughs> remain a clinician because it is truly uh, something I loved doing. But I, I've always seen, especially in countries like ours, with, where we have so many challenges, unless we really work also on the health system uh, improvements uh, and make it better for those who are working on the clinical uh, work, it, things won't uh, improve. So that was why I was uh, progressively drawn to the more into the public health, the policy, the leadership role, and later landed in the ministry as a state minister and now the minister of health. What a great journey. Um, um, and um, thanks for sharing that. One of the lessons I heard there for the learners um, uh, on this discussion is that uh, most of us have got to our places not because we sought it as a destination, but we kept exposing ourselves to new opportunities. And what I heard from your discussion is bumping into people who open new doors for us. So I, I think we could both always encourage our learners, keep, keep exposing yourself to being disrupted. Um, um, you're never gonna plan out your course in full, but uh, take a step into the unknown and make things happen. Uh, like Leah has, um, who has just had a wonderful journey, wonderful preparation. And um, I want to start to, to steer the conversation a bit, Leah, into educational models. But before I do, I wonder if I could just pick up on a tension that you referred to. Um, you know, you started out like me with a passion to take care of people and then individuals. And then as you were doing so, you thought you, you saw, boy, the system isn't very good. And you got restless about taking care of the system, fixing the system and doing population health, which, you know, thank, 
thank goodness we've got our colleagues in public health and and in other places that that think much better about that than than those of us who are physicians but that tension where you had to leave taking care of the individual to suddenly think about um, taking care of populations and thinking about systems. How have you navigated that? How have you dealt with that kind of starting off with, with one passion? And then um, I imagine you're so busy right now, you don't have that luxury of taking care of an individual because you're focusing on 115 million people. Could, could you speak to, to that a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely it has, uh, especially in the beginning, it was uh, ch challenging for me because uh, as you know, as a clinician, when you take care of patients, uh, you see the, the results quickly. And especially in OBGYN, I think we see it much quicker <laughs> than you do in internal medicine. <laughs> but so that was really what, what makes it also more gratifying. But when you're working in, in the leadership roles, health system improvement, the change takes time to see. So really that, that was one of the, uh, missing the, the role of clinical work by itself is one thing, but also that, that challenge of this requires time, requires patience uh, to, but eventually you see uh, the change and eventually those changes have bigger impact for many people. So I think that's what uh, eventually seeing those results uh, uh, making an impact, it really, uh, became more gratifying and uh, now I can think of what can I do more on, on that regard. So uh, it has definitely, it's, it's, it was challenging uh, and still I, I sometimes still miss it, but uh, I also see my role uh, can be, bring bigger impact. Well, I know I speak for many when I say thank you uh, for making that transition. Um, I, I know you're making a big difference in your current role. As we start to think about education, you, you have such a unique perch. Um, you're, you're, you're looking over a system, you're thinking about society as, you know, and the public good. Sometimes those of us in education can be accused of just living in the ivory tower. You know, we're just doing our ivory tower uh, polishing where we're writing our papers, doing our education, but often we could be criticized for not connecting education to the good of society. So you spent so much time in education. Now you're dealing with the good of society. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit about education models that, you see, that, that you've seen work, um, um, that you've been particularly attracted to. And obviously you're a citizen of, of two worlds. You've, we were lucky to have you with us here in Ann Arbor for a number of years, deeply embedded in our system. Um, you came from Ethiopia, you went back to Ethiopia. Um, so you know two worlds. Could you talk about education systems that, um, and maybe some of your reflections on that connectivity between Michigan and Ethiopia, um, and how we can better design education for uh, the good of society? Thank you, Joe. Uh, overall, I think when we see the education system and the bigger uh, uh, system, the society, the, the impact of the academic systems cannot be really separately taken uh, from, from the overall uh, growth or development in any society. Uh, I may be focused on more on the health sector because I'm in the health sector in terms of also the education. My, my examples may be more uh, inclined to that, but definitely, uh, the education, what, what we produce in the education system is what eventually influences how we develop as, as a society, as, as countries, as nations. And uh, in terms of uh, models, especially in terms of, uh, since you mentioned especially how uh, the models of partnership uh, uh, 
work and what I have seen, um, there has been uh, different experiences of different types of uh, partnerships uh, uh, that I have uh, had the chance to experience in terms of in my different roles uh, uh, throughout, uh, but especially in academic partnerships, we've seen uh, uh, some are specifically uh, driven by specific projects that may be time bounded. So, and also specific uh, tailored, tailor made, uh, uh, and, and some are really uh, built, evolve continuously, and are built by uh, uh, mutual partnerships in of uh, both institutions in in uh, countries, and mostly since we are talking about also north and south uh, partnerships and collaborations uh, and uh, so i had those different opportunities and even there are also has been have been instances like uh, in where universities in, in the us and other countries have been engaged in establishing vertical programs in uh, countries when we ha we had the need for that like the hi when hiv programs were introduced in many african countries they were mostly led or supported by uh, uh, universities in the north, which had its own really huge advantage, but also had its own challenges in the way the uh, the, the vertical programs were designed uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, so, but I, I definitely would like to highlight how our uh, partnership with the University of Michigan, especially when I was, which started at St. Paul for us, uh, well, had, had evolved and really the the a strong results and successes of that partnership. Uh, and of course, of course, we will all have challenges, but uh, I would uh, say uh, from uh, the different partnership, it has been one of really the strong partnerships, um, partnership models. It initially began with uh, really uh, solving the problem at uh, the priority problem in the host country. So usually, I think many years back, we have seen a lot of partnerships globally where it usually focused on getting experience for students uh, and main, mainly that is a focus, although all partnership, uh, partnerships still have that, uh, uh, need to have that core pillar, but this was one of that uh, aspects of the partnership. It mainly focused on what is the key challenge that we have in the system and how can that partnership help in solving that problem. So developing training programs through the partnership was the big uh, priority we agreed upon and we co-designed the curriculum that's needed for opening those residency training programs. Uh, and then also it was not just run by, uh, because these were new programs, we, we didn't have enough faculty, but that didn't even mean that it was run by uh, University of Michigan faculty. It was actually run by the local faculty that was supported by uh, strongly supported by University of Michigan faculty were coming with students and also our faculty were going to, to get that experience sharing as well to Michigan. And this also really uh, uh, was not just focused on having just a residency program, but it made sure the quality of training was competency based. It also made sure it included service quality improvements as part of the core aspect of the, the, the partnership. So it just didn't focus only on the academic piece, but also the service that is being provided to the community as well. And it embedded also research in the, in the partnership. It was really a core component, which, which uh, helped in, in two main ways. One is in developing research capacity of the local uh, faculty, but also in generating evidence that can help in improving uh, services again, uh, local getting more local evidences uh, for improvement. Uh, so the sustainable model of those programs, which eventually were fully run by the, the faculty uh, locally, uh, is really a true uh, a key aspect of uh, the models that the model that I have seen uh, work very well in terms of especially the sustainable uh, building capabilities sustainably. Uh, so it was a holistic, I can say it was a holistic approach, but also uh, anchored on sustainability. Well, thank you. And it's been really a privilege for us to share that journey with, um, with you and your colleagues in Ethiopia. And again, we're talking about education. So I'm glad you, you talked about training and um, 
Um, you know, obviously this fireside chat is a little bit more connected to health, but we're very mindful that health is only one, one como component or dimension of, of, of Africa Week, this discussion. But um, I reflect on some of our past models of training and education and global health. Um, I think many of us in the United States are mindful about 25% about of the doctors in the United States come from outside of the United States. And um, I'm very aware uh, that's a space I spent a lot of time in. Um, and uh, it became very clear to me that we often attract people to come here because of our education systems. But unfortunately, we then train people not to fit in back home. I think most people, when they go someplace, they they often think they're going there for a little bit and uh, then they're gonna go back home. But because of our education system here, people you know, have to train for three, four, five years. By that time, they've learned skills that are appropriate to our system. It's a, a context that uh, they've been trained for, but it doesn't necessarily translate for them back home. So um, unfortunately, those of us in the United States have been very guilty of creating brain drain, attracting people here, training them not to fit in back home, and here they stay. What we so enjoyed about uh, partnering with Ethiopia was the chance to train people in Ethiopia within that context, and for us to learn and be um, part of that and be transformed by that process. But I'm so again, inspired by your journey. Uh, you were trained there, then spent time in the United States. Then you went back. Uh, uh, were there things uh, about your time at the University of Michigan or things about your time in Ann Arbor that you think particularly uh, prepared you to be health minister? Um, were there things that advantaged you um, and really set you up to succeed in your current role? Looking back, are there things that you learned while you were here at University of Michigan that, that are helping you out now? Yes, definitely. I mean, every uh, step of my journey has had its own contributions in the three years at the University of Michigan, uh, which really had uh, the, gave me the opportunity to connect with different schools within the university uh, and different partners of the university. So, uh, and also look into the system of how the education system uh, has been working uh, at the university and the collaborations we've had, it was not uh, limited to where the uh, Center uh, for International Reproductive Health Training was seated on, it was not limited. I had, uh, been had the opportunity to work with uh, different uh, uh, parts of the medical school, the School of Public Health, and, and other uh, members of the university uh, um, as uh, in, the, in the university as a whole, and even beyond that, also uh, with different partnerships through the university and the the experience and the, the learnings of, especially the models of training, uh, and also the different leadership models and programs that were in place were quite a learning for me uh, uh, that really also helped us also we are while i was there uh, the work that we are doing was expanding in the uh, work in ethiopia but also we had the work started in rwanda as well so all those uh, opportunities had uh, their own impact on, on uh, uh, has helped me uh, definitely in in the progress and it was truly a learning opportunity for me and uh, uh, an opportunity to also form really amazing relationships. And uh, I've learned from many, uh, many members of the faculty at the University of Michigan and including you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Um, I can assure you I've gotten much more from our relationship and from what I've learned um, in my times in Ethiopia. Um, than, uh, than I've been able to contribute. So thank you. 
Um, for our audience, um, I will uh, try and do my best to weave in any questions uh, that people have. If um, people would like to use the question box, and I, I will try and um, and and add those in as they come up. Um, Leah, we're talking as we talk about education, maybe reflecting on the Michigan Ethiopia um, interface, an area that has come up for us in global health is this whole concept of decolonizing global health. Um, I have to say we're probably a little bit behind other disciplines. I think the field of education and of course anthropology and other areas have been talking about this for decades. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit in some of your earlier comments. Um, um, we've really been imposing agendas often on the, on the African continent. Um, uh, you touched on HIV and AIDS, you know, and suddenly the United States came up with $30 billion through their PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief um, into Africa, but it was driven by a very specific agenda and unfortunately, if we look back on a lot of the, the research funding that comes onto the continent, it can also often be driven by a, an agenda in the global north. That's where the money comes from. Um, so we're way behind in the global health movement in trying to think about how do we decolonize our approach and our thinking. Um, can you offer us any, any advice on, on trying to decolonize global health. Um, you know, obviously the, the infusion of, of some money and some talent has been good, but um, suddenly dominating the, the agenda um, and driving um, a specific worldview is, is colonization, colonization again. And, um, so I know the global health community uh, nationally, but um, um, uh, uh, many of us are trying to wrestle with this. Any advice, any observations? Yes, uh, definitely the growth, the interest, the growth in the interest in global health and uh, partnerships, especially academic partnerships uh, so in the past few decades has been really truly helpful in many ways for uh, for all countries in terms of academic development and um, de I mean, grows in the uh, area of uh, different uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, and the, the way that the, it was, uh, the, the, as you said, the way the colonization uh, uh, kind of approach has, has progressively definitely improved uh, to make it more a mutual a mutual programs, uh, but as you said, there are still uh, rooms uh, uh, for improvement in in our approach our approach uh, these days as well. Uh, most programs, I think, as I as I mentioned earlier, are uh, focusing on the local uh, problems and how to address a local context, but also the solutions have to be also mutually uh, uh, driven, mutually designed, because it's not just uh, addressing the local problem, but how we address the problem should also not be just, as you said, imposed. And even in research, as you said, most research uh, areas, interest areas would come, uh, but uh, it should be designed together in terms of starting from the question we want to answer in the research uh, and then what we want to solve through the research, of course, needs that uh, that approach. And uh, and of course, there are of course many motivation factors for uh, the, the uh, uh, all players in global health. Uh, the many motivation. Most of them are really very good, uh, well meant. But we always have to focus on the impact it brings to improve the gaps that we have, especially the equity gaps that we have. And how can ultimately this partnership bring us closer and bring those countries to 
really a sustainable the 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 road to sustainable development it should ultimately bring that result be it through academia be it through health programs and others uh, i think that is one key uh, uh, was it should be one key motivating factor mutual one it should have the benefit should be for both sides uh, but it should have a local context uh, local problem solving and uh, uh, also with a passion really with a uh, commitment to bring some change in, the, in terms of the uh, uh, progress progress of in those in those uh, defi defined disciplines. We are talking about all disciplines, not just health, but right. that's why it, it, I'm usually pulled to that. <laughs> but definitely in all aspects of development, the education, health, and other sectors. Uh, uh, so I think that's the main uh, the main core principles i think uh, if, the, if those motivating factors are there and ultimately we should think of uh, ownership to be by by uh, the local institutions otherwise the sustainability usually goes back and that's not what we want if we uh, invest that much of uh, our time and uh, resources then it should show meaningful progress and sustainable one so ownership also has to be uh, also, I think, given to the local uh, uh, institutions. Yeah, I think that was very well said. Um, I so like our, our discussion that it's mainly focused on health, not health care, health. Um, we know that the social determinants of health cross so many different disciplines. Um, I think all of the disciplines at, at the University of Michigan and at Alice Ababa University and the great schools of higher education in Ethiopia. So there's so many determinants of health and, and that's really what we're talking about. Um, you've talked about sustainability. I think it's such a crucial word. Um, you know, what's the win-win for both sides? Um, a lot of times higher education in the United States have, have looked at places in the global south as, uh, as a place for their learners. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna ship off our students. That's the win for us. We provide them with a learning opportunity. I think what we've been trying to do, at least in our relationships with Ethiopia, and this exists with many of our schools, is stay very mindful of the win-win. I think sustainability requires a win-win. Um, at least from my perch, I see a lot of do-gooders running into a place, but if they don't create the sustainability model um, on our side, um, it's not going to continue. You know, there's a good heart there, but it's not going to continue. Um, yet, if it's just one-sided, we're getting a benefit from sending off our students or our researchers can get access to data. Um, that's, that's, that's very um, colonial um, and that's not win-win. So I do believe there's an art and science to collaboration and how we, how we design and think, think about that. I wonder if we could spend um, the last five minutes trying to dream about the future here I'm going to try and weave in some of the questions that we've seen, but um, I wonder if we could dream about what the University of Michigan Ethiopia uh, collaboration looks like in 2040. What's that New York Times article read like? Um, what have we accomplished? What have we done together? What's the win-win? What's what's you know what what are we building towards? Can you think of some elements? that you're hoping are just vibrant and alive in the uh, University of Michigan, um, Ethiopia uh, collaboration in 2040. And I'll do the same uh, because we're, we're both gonna be mindful of our wind side, but uh, can we just uh, uh, dream and, uh, and, and see what that looks like? Uh, uh, would you like to start or is it easier for me to start? <laughs> You can start. <laughs> All right. Yes, um, I, I can be fuller of hot air, as you know, through our long years mm -hmm. of friendship. But I would love a platform where that's so porous 
that people are going back and forth between Ethiopia and the University of Michigan um, physically, but also making use of these things we're learning through Zoom, um, where we can have a much deeper appreciation of the context, the culture, and the people. Um, I would love that kind of exposure for our students so that they can have their assumptions disrupted. You know, we, also, we always have a vision of something af far away. We develop our assumptions, but whenever we get there, our assumptions are disrupted. So that people could have their dis assumptions totally disrupted and have a deep understanding of what is the situation in Ethiopia. What are the richness um, in the appreciation of the culture? But what's the problems? And what are the problem solving opportunities? And to have that same way for people from Ethiopia to embed themselves in our culture without having to be totally transformed. They can kind of go back and forth like you have and bring some of the good parts back over the net and maybe keep going back and forth. And that that is such an enabled process that people feel transformed and the University of Michigan continues to be a better place because of what they've learned from the partnership in Ethiopia and that maybe Ethiopia is better and, um, and people are, what they've learned from the partnership with Michigan and that maybe we're the partner of choice when people are saying, I wanna do research, I wanna study, I wanna make things better. Um, and that we just have this easy platform that's, um, that, that is, is just very enabled, um, that builds on UMAPS and, and some of the other um, uh, programs that we have underway, but it's transforming our institution and if we could reach that state with, um, with Ethiopia, I think we would be um, so privileged. But um, that's, that's my dream. That's what I'd like to see the New York Times article um, uh, writing uh, about, but thoughts or, or reactions? Well, that's, that's beautiful, Joe. You have uh, finished <laughs> what I would like also to see. It's beautiful. And uh, before I just say that, uh, what I would look, like to see, what just to reflect a little bit on what you said earlier on, uh, on how, well, to get to 2040, we need to have really a sustainable uh, uh, partnership model. And I think one of the, the key um, elements we always have in partnerships is the soft element, the people element, which strong relationships are always there. Strong, uh, those who are committed to push those partnerships are there to, uh, to help it flourish, but also that needs to be supported through a system in, at, in both ends uh, to make it sustainable. I think that's one thing we may do better to reach to where we want to, do, to go. I remember when I was in Michigan, we always have been trying to, uh, uh, to I mean, track who is doing what in the different disciplines in Ethiopia because even in Michigan, within the University of Michigan, there were many faculty doing work in Ethiopia, but didn't know that uh, uh, each other, but there was no a core, strong, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what, there was a, an attempt through the uh, provost office now that uh, Valerie leads uh, to have the AMC uh, uh, initiative, but, uh, that kind of really a system, having a system in place to coordinate all those activities so that it doesn't depend on people's motivation because there is always a driver, driving force behind to ensure that continues, but that needs to be there also here in Ethiopia in the different institutions, uh, at ministry level, at different levels, so that this continues because we need to really continue to build on what we have started, which is really, uh, I feel like this is one of the model partnerships that has been built for Ethiopia and it needs to continue. And, and we have seen a lot of uh, training programs being established and even big uh, 
healthcare programs like kidney transplant that were established through this partnership in Ethiopia. So I do hope in 2040, those partnerships will continue to flourish and even having a strong program already in place that is led by the local institution doesn't mean that it doesn't need the partnership anymore. It still continues to improve it. The research aspect is there. Still, we are, we are continuously improving. Let alone in Ethiopia, you are continuously improving at the University of the Kerry Havat, Michigan. So uh, that continues and we want to see uh, several because we have a vision now to really expand a lot of things in Ethiopia. So with the partnership, I want to see this amount of training programs opened and really full-fledged capacity created. And this kind of uh, evidence is generated that have helped sol bring solution to the local community, but also have brought a lot of uh, impact also in Michigan. So hopefully that's uh, the future we will see. And I'm sure we'll, we will be able to see that with the strong commitment and passion and with the different institutions and institutes in within the University of Michigan as well. Well, thank you. And I know we're in time. Uh, Minister Tedesi, it's been so good to have this conversation. Thank you for your friendship. And I know um, Ethiopia and the University of Michigan are going to continue to grow together and be uh, better off for it. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to um, to our moderators for, for the wrap up. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kovalars and Minister Tadesi for this engaging discussion. I really like how much of it has focused on exchanges between Ethiopia and the US. And that sets us up perfectly for the next part of Africa week. So our next panel, which begins at 9.30, Eastern time, so in seven minutes, is focused on exchange programs between Africa and the United States and the role that it plays in this ecosystem that has been the theme of, of all of Africa Week. So thank you, Joe and Leah. Um, thank you for everybody who joined us for this conversation. Um, please stay online. Um, we will use this exact same Zoom webinar link also for the panel discussion starting in six or seven minutes. Thank you.